David Joseph Mira was born on March 7, 1967, to Jeannie Mira. The identity of his biological father is unknown. By 1970, David lived with his mom and her boyfriend, Leon Zerfus, in Dixon, New Mexico. People who knew Zerfus said he was violent, abusive, and often unfaithful in his romantic relationships. In 1969, Jeannie became pregnant with Zerfus's child. On January 10, 1970, she went to Embudo Presbyterian Hospital, where she gave birth to her daughter, Elia. While she was in the hospital, Zerfus was charged with watching two-year-old David. Jeannie last saw her boyfriend and son outside the building on the 10th. When she got home the next day, David was gone, along with all his toys and clothes. When Jeannie asked Zerfus where David was, he said he'd given David to another family. At first, he said they were a childless couple from back east, but he later changed his story several times. A blonde photographer and a family living in a hippie bus, among others, were said to have taken responsibility for David. After David's disappearance, the family moved to California. About a year later, after a huge fight with Leon Zerfus, Jeannie Mira took baby Elia back to New Mexico, where she reported David missing. It's not clear exactly why she waited so long to do this, but there has been speculation that Zerfus wouldn't let her do it. Jeannie tried to find David on her own, but according to Elia, her mom didn't have the resources to find him, and nobody helped. When Elia was a teenager, she asked her dad what had happened. He maintained his story that he'd given David away. Jeannie Mira went on to have three more daughters and two more sons. She died in 1989 at the age of 45. Leon Zerfus died in 2005. Many of David's family members believe Leon Zerfus killed him and buried his body in the rocks or hills in the area. The few speculating about this case online tend to agree but also note that it is possible David could have been illegally adopted. David Joseph Mira was two years old when he was last seen in Dixon, New Mexico on January 10th, 1970. David is described as a white male with Hispanic descent, three feet tall and 50 pounds at the time of his disappearance with brown hair and eyes. He has a birthmark in the center of his back and would be 55 years old if alive today. If you have any information about this case, you can contact the New Mexico State Police at 505-827-9300. Two days before Christmas in 1977, 17-year-old Jerry Armstrong had dinner with his family, then went to a school dance with his girlfriend. For the drive, he'd borrowed a 1973 Pontiac Le Mans owned by his brother James. Around 11 p.m., Jerry dropped his girlfriend off at her house and then left. She would be the last person to see him. Jerry had told his parents he would be home by midnight. When he didn't come home, his mom was worried and both his parents started looking for him. He was reported missing the next day. James died in 1984 and their mom in 1987. In 2009, human remains were found in a riverbank in Arkansas that belonged to a black male in his teens, just like Jerry. DNA testing was underway at the time. I couldn't find any official updates, though it seems clear the bones were not Jerry's. So what happened to Jerry? There is a theory that he ran away, but most people speculating about this case don't seem to be convinced. Jerry seemed to have a lot of good things going for him. He had a steady girlfriend, was the quarterback on his school's football team, and had a job at a gas station. The trunk of his brother's car was also reportedly filled with Christmas presents Jerry planned on giving to his younger siblings in just a couple of days. The most prominent theory in this case is that Jerry was the victim of a hate crime. His brother James, whose car he was driving that night, 
was dating a white girl at the time. Jerry's family thinks he may have been mistaken for James by someone who didn't like this. The family also claimed to get a threatening phone call at some point in the investigation. According to them, the caller used a racial slur and said they should tell the investigators in the case to back off. Some speculators agree. Others wonder if it was a carjacking gone wrong or if he accidentally drove the car into a body of water. Jerry Lee Armstrong was 17 years old when he was last seen in Hernando, Mississippi on December 23, 1977. Jerry is a black male who was 5 feet 6 inches tall and 145 pounds at the time of his disappearance with black hair and brown eyes. He was driving a white 1973 Pontiac Le Mans with red and black stripes down the side and the license plate DAY458. He has a scar over his left eye and would be 61 years old if alive today. If you have any information about this case, you can contact the DeSoto County Sheriff's Department at 1-662-469-1000. Christina Lynn Carter was born on May 29, 1970. In mid-1973, her parents divorced and were soon in the midst of a custody battle for their now three-year-old daughter. On September 17th of that year, about two months after the divorce, Christy and her mom, Janet, were last seen together in Hueytown, Alabama. After several days of not hearing from his daughter, Christie's father asked around to relatives trying to figure out where she was. When he couldn't find her, he reported her missing. However, other family members didn't think Christie or Janet, who also hadn't been heard from, were actually missing. They'd been planning a trip with Janet's new boyfriend, and most people assumed the mother and daughter were either still on the trip or in hiding due to the custody battle. On October 7th, Human remains were found in a duffel bag along a road in the Great Smoky Mountains National Park, the same place Janet and Christie were said to be headed. About a month later, the remains were identified as those of Christie's mother, Janet Carter. Her cause of death was suffocation, and she'd been dead for less than a day when her body was found. There was no sign of Christie. Even though Christie had already been reported missing, it wasn't until her mom's body was found that police really started to look for her. An extensive search of the park turned up nothing. A week after Janet's body had been found, a wrecked abandoned car was found on I-26, which runs from eastern Tennessee to South Carolina. The car was registered to an Alabama dealership. Inside the car, police found women and children's clothing, a woman's purse, food, and utensils. A hole was found in the front windshield, and there were strands of blonde hair in the broken glass. The FBI, who was now involved in the case, investigated a possible link between the car and Janet and Christie's case. However, none was ever found. Janet's murder remains unsolved, and Christie has never been located. So what happened to Christie? Did her mom leave her with someone else before she was killed? Is she still alive out there somewhere? Were she and her mom both abducted at the same time? And if so, where is Christy now? The only hint I found of someone being investigated in this case was Janet's new boyfriend, who was married to someone else at the time. Even though he was reportedly going on the trip with him, his wife gave an alibi for him. It's not clear if this alibi was for the day Janet and Christy were last seen, the day Janet was murdered, or for something else. He has since died. Christina Lynn Carter was three years old when she was last seen in Hueytown, Alabama on September 17, 1973. Christy, as she is more commonly known, is a white female who was 3 feet 2 inches tall and 30 pounds at the time of her disappearance with blonde or strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. If alive today, she would be 51 years old. 
If you have any information about this case, you can contact the Hueytown Police Department at 1-205-491-3587. Irene Lenora LaRosa was born on April 10, 1953, in Hartford, Connecticut, to Irene and Nathan LaRosa. She had at least two older sisters and would eventually be one of 11 children. When Irene was a year old, she and two of her siblings were taken out of the home due to neglect and lived in a Catholic orphanage in New Britain, Connecticut for several years. In 1964, when Irene was 12, the siblings went back home. The family moved a few times after this and eventually settled in Ellington, Connecticut. As a child, Irene loved music, especially singing. She felt like she lived in the shadow of her older siblings and often wanted the same privileges they had. She often fought with her parents, as many kids do, and left home several times as a teenager. At some point, she told a friend that one of her brothers had raped her. It's not clear exactly when Irene was last seen, but it was sometime in 1971 when she was 17. She reportedly just walked away from her home and didn't return. Her mom would later say she ran off with a guy. Irene's family members looked for her over the years, but weren't able to find her. Some of them attempted to file a missing persons report in the early days, but were unsuccessful for various reasons. In 1975, someone else in Irene's family would also go missing. Susan LaRosa was married to Irene's brother, Bob, and according to him, left home after an argument, never to return. Her remains were found three years later in a wooded area in Vermont. The couple's daughter claimed her dad sexually abused her and that she witnessed him kill her mom. Bob was the prime suspect in Susan's murder, but he was never charged. He died in 2018. Susan's murder is also thought to be linked to several other unsolved disappearances in the area, including Janice Pocket, who disappeared in 1973, Deborah Spickler in 1968, and Lisa White in 1974. Irene was reported missing in 2016 by her niece, Tina Richburg. Police searched one of the properties where Irene used to live. A search of a well on the property turned up five pairs of girls' shoes and a few articles of clothing. So what happened to Irene? There is speculation online that her brother Bob might have been involved. After all, two of his family members going missing over the span of a few years is a big coincidence. Irene also claimed to have been raped by one of her brothers before she went missing, and one of Bob's daughters also accused him of sexual abuse. However, her niece, Tina Richburg, believes another one of her uncles, Nathan LaRosa, may have been responsible. According to Miss Richburg, her dad described his brother Nathan as a very bad guy and didn't want his children around him by themselves. She also claimed that some of Irene's other siblings have also alleged sexual abuse from him. Whatever the case, Irene hasn't been seen in over 50 years, and her family wants to find her. Irene Lenora LaRosa was 17 years old when she was last seen in Ellington, Connecticut in 1971. Irene is a white female who was 5 feet 4 inches tall and 115 pounds at the time of her disappearance, with brown hair and green eyes. She went by the nickname Rini and would be 69 years old, if alive today. If you have any information about this case, you can contact the Connecticut State Police at 1-860-896- 3200. Anna Marie Arguello was born on September 12, 1967, one of six siblings. She was last seen sometime in late 1969 or early 1970. 
The story of her reported last days was relayed as follows by her sister, Margarita. This day, nine-year-old Margarita was told by their mom, Anita Vega, to stay home from school and check on Anna Marie. Anna Marie had been beaten, deprived of food, and put in a cold room naked, all for wetting her bed the night before. When Margarita checked on her sister, she found that Anna Marie had found a pair of shorts and wet those as well. This is when Anita Vega ordered Margarita to draw a bath of cold water. What followed was several hours of Anna Marie alternating between being in the cold water and being beaten by her mother. At one point, Anita ordered Margarita to run cold water over Anna Marie's body. Anita eventually left the room, then later told Margarita to check on her sister again. Margarita found Anna Marie floating face down in the water and told her mom she thought her sister was dead. Anita put Anna Marie on the back porch and wrapped her in a blanket. Even though she had started to make noise, Anita told Margarita, if you ever tell, I'll kill you. And you've seen me do it, so you know I can. When her other children got home from school, she told them Anna Marie was dead and that they'd had the funeral while they were gone. Margarita went back out to the porch to get some toys for a sibling and heard Anna Marie making more noise. Later on that afternoon, Luis, who was Anita's boyfriend and would later become her husband, got home from work. He soon left again and came back holding a box. Margarita overheard her mom asking what had taken him so long to get home. He replied, it wasn't easy to bury a body in the frozen ground. Around 1985, Margarita said her mom gave her a brown sack with dirt and a bone inside, claiming the bone belonged to Anna Marie. Anita would later claim she buried the sack in a local cemetery. Anna Marie's disappearance wouldn't be reported to police until 1992. Margarita, who was in her 30s by this time, told her therapist about it after suffering from nightmares from it for years. The staff at the mental health facility where she was getting therapy said she had to report Anna Marie's murder or they would do it for her. When police learned of the disappearance, they searched the cemetery where Anita Vega had claimed to bury Anna Marie's body, but they found only animal bones. They eventually uncovered Anna Marie's birth certificate and one photo of her, the only evidence she ever existed. Anita Vega was questioned about her daughter's murder in 1993. She initially denied Anna Marie's existence, but admitted it when investigators showed her the birth certificate. She said that day she had found Anna Marie unconscious and waited for Luis to come home. Then he'd buried her. She later changed her story and said she'd found Anna Marie dead on the bed. She claimed she'd kept Anna Marie's death a secret because she was afraid Luis would be deported if anyone knew of his involvement. In 1994, Anita Vega was convicted of involuntary manslaughter. She was sentenced to 1 to 10 years in prison and ended up serving 3. Her other children support her and don't believe Margarita's story. Anna Marie's remains have never been found. Anna Marie Arguello was 2 years old when she was last seen in Frankfort, Indiana in late 1969 or early 1970. Anna Marie was a Native American female with dark brown hair and brown eyes. She is no longer believed to be alive, but would be 54 years old if she was.